Hello Life Changes Church, we are so excited that you clicked on this video. We are in a series called What's It Like? As we look at the parables that Jesus told as he unpacked the kingdom of God for us. So why don't you get ready, sit back, grab a notebook, grab a pen as we get encouraged by this word. He introduced me as Chris um, and the better half of me is sitting over there, that beautiful woman, Robin. And we have the absolute honor to raise four children. We are those guys who did it. I don't know if there's a, there's a photo. There's the photo. Uh, you need another screen to fit us all on. But So my little Soph, she's the oldest. She is the adopted daughter of our family. And this child is an incredible athlete. Incredible. She ran 4.2 kilometers yesterday, and she's six years old. Okay. Then, then we've got my little Pagey Pops, who is the singer-songwriter, and she's got the most incredible brain on her, okay? And then my Josie Jo, the little blonde bombshell, who is me, completely me. She is feisty, and she has determination. She will defy gravity if she could, okay? And then that little boy there, uh, we adopted him four months ago. Uh, he is beautiful. And I have to be honest with you, I don't know what his talent is. I don't know what his gift is right now. But he has the most beautiful smile. He's got these dimples that will break hearts. And you've got to understand, with a family of six, our house is complete and utter chaos. (laughs) Complete and utter chaos. It's like, who's watched Sing 2? Probably the best movie ever made, I'll, I'll be honest with you. But it starts off with all the minions standing there, and the one starts... Then the other one starts singing, the other one, and it's exactly like my house. The one starts screaming, then the other starts screaming, and the other starts screaming. And our, our dinner table is complete chaos. From the one telling us what he's got, they're going to go and do in the toilet, to <laughs> spitting food out. And it's just, but it's such a beautiful picture of what God showed us. He showed us, Robin and I, what he was going to give us as a family. He showed us these beautiful kids, and he said, I want you to raise them. And we do. We have beautiful moments. We sit in the evenings and we read the Bible together. And we read their little little kids down version of of the Bible. And we were reading Revelation the other night. And it was speaking about what what, what heaven looks like. And they all started. It was like, and the unicorns and the the rivers of, of ice cream and all these things. But it was so cute. I know it's so cute, but there's a reality there. There's an expectation there. There's, these kids understand that there's a heaven. These kids at their age understand that they are waiting for something. And it's like us. We are waiting for something. And the Israelites were waiting for something for so many years. They were waiting for their Messiah to come. They were waiting for Him to come and change them and, and break them and set them free from, from slavery. And Jesus teaches us. He teaches us what His kingdom looks like. He teaches us in the parables. He teaches us about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven looks like. And that is what we're going to do tonight. We've got to understand, friends, that that there is a way to read the parables. There's a way to interpret them. Uh, There's context. There's absolute context. You've got to read it in uh, Jesus was preaching and teaching the guys of those days. But I do believe that the Holy Spirit convicts, teaches and directs each and every single one of us with the Word of God. And I pray that, that God does that tonight. And Jesus comes and He starts teaching these parables and starts talking about what the kingdom of God looks like, kingdom of heaven looks like. And He says that it is simple. He said it is completely simple, but there's also a mystery to it. He wants it to be simple so that the guys that were following him, us, we can understand it. We can grasp it. Those who are digging deep into him can understand and grasp the concept of the kingdom of heaven. But he keeps that mystery. Even for us, he keeps that mystery. I can tell you, preaching on a parable, I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. When I started digging deep, there was so much that I didn't understand. There was so much there, and that is what God wants for us. 
And I want to I wanna go through Matthew 25, 14 to 30. And it's the parable of the bags of gold. And some of your translations might be the bag or the, the parable of the talents. So if you want to go there, if you've got your Bibles, it will be on the screen as well and we'll go through it together. It says, again, it is like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his wealth. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another ba- one bag, each according to their ability. Um, then he went on his journey. The man who received the five bags of gold went out at once and put the money to work and gave five bags more. So also the one who took two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who received the one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled their accounts with them. The man who received the five bags of gold brought another five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful for, with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in the master's happiness. Then the man who received one bag of gold came, and he said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, go, so you, sorry, you wicked and lazy servant, so you knew that I harvest where I do not sow and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put the money in the deposit with the bankers that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who have 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more. They will have in abundance. Whoever does not have, even that they have, will be taken away from them. And throw throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for... Your word. Your word is your word and it's powerful and it's here to change lives. And I pray that you do that tonight, Jesus, with your word, that you would change lives, that you would encourage people, but we would walk out of here completely changed for your good, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I, I'm going to go through the scripture and I'm going to go through line by line. I don't have points, but I really need to unpack scripture here tonight. And I feel that God has got so much here. And it says in 14, it says again. And this is Jesus speaking. He's, he speaks in these parables. He speaks in, in ways that, that we need to understand. But he has a link in between with all the parables that he speaks. And this link keeps, he's the master uh, storyteller. He is incredible in what he does. But this link, he, he's linking between the parable before. And that is of the, the ten servants. And it, it shows us that, he, well, he's teaching us that, that there is, what is the kingdom going to be like? He says the kingdom of God will be. In Matthew 13, all the parables that he teaches in Matthew 13, the kingdom of God is like. And there's this beautiful picture of this timing, this, 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 this gap in between. And that's how he links everything together. Season 14 carries on. It'll be, a man, it'll be like a man going on a journey. We need to remember that this is a picture When Jesus is speaking in parables, he's teaching about himself. He's teaching about the kingdom of heaven. He said when when he was starting in ministry, he said the kingdom of God is near. And we need to understand that that's exactly what what Jesus did. The master didn't say, I'm not going to come back. I'm I'm leaving. I'm going away. He said, I'm going on a journey, and I'm coming back. And it's a picture of Jesus. He left us. He died for us. He gave us everything that he had for us. And he went on a journey, he went away, and he said, I will leave you with a helper. But I am coming back. There's that promise. It continues, who called his servants and entrusted them with his wealth. 
And I think this is a foreign concept to us. In these today times, it is a foreign concept for someone to give a slave, a servant, money. But in back then, it wasn't uncommon. There wasn't like a, a net bank down the road where you can go and deposit the bank, your money in the bank and know that it, there's going to be a return from it. There wasn't such a thing. And I think, like I said now, I think we need to read this parable with the idea that it wasn't just a servant. These servants had no rights. They had nothing to their name. They didn't own anything. They had no rights to their time, to their talents, to their gifts, to anything that they did. They were slaves. And we need to read it like that. So, th so what this, this story is telling us is that these servants had no rights. They didn't have a right to anything. But this master left everything. He didn't just leave half. It didn't say, I left 10%. It didn't say, I left half of it. He said, he left his wealth with these guys. And it's such a beautiful picture of what God does with us. We are slaves to Christ. It says in the Word in the Old Testament, we are servants of God. In the New Testament, we are slaves to Jesus. And we have no rights whatsoever because of the sin in us. But we have every right in Jesus. We have, we are heirs to everything that we have in Jesus. And it's a credible picture of how God gives us everything. He gives us our wives, our children, our, our jobs, our everything for us to steward and steward it well. He gives it to us and said, take it and use it. We are there only to be obedient, only to receive with two hands and actually just be obedient in what we do. And it's this, this upside down, backwards, 180 degree picture of what the kingdom of heaven is like. He doesn't say, I'm going to give the best of the best to the best of the best. He says, I'm going to give the best of the best to you and to you and to you and to me. I don't deserve that. I don't deserve anything that he has to give me. But it's this upside down picture. And it's beautiful. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 3 to 10, I'm not going to go through all of it, but in the message version it says, you are blessed when you end at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and His rule. You are blessed when you feel you've lost what you most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You are blessed when your uh, content with just uh, who you are, no more, no less. That is the moment when you find yourself proud owners of everything that cannot be bought. And it moves on in, in, in 15, it says, To the one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. So not only did the master give them everything he had, but he gave to all of them. He gave to all of them, and not just a small amount, he gave an enormous amount. Now, the word talent in English actually comes, is derived from this parable, but the Greek word talenton is about 6,000 denarii, which is 20 years of a labor's salary. Now, I worked it out. I'm one of those guys that sat there with a calculator last night going, how much is that? And it works out, and for those who are Bible scholars and are going to come and tell me that I'm wrong, that's fine. But it, it worked out in my brain at about 2 million rand a talent. 2 million rand. So, so he went out and he gave... 10 million to one guy, 4 million to another guy, and 2 million to another guy. That's enormous money. And that's what he does for us. He gives us everything that he has. And he gives us according to our ability. That master gave according to their ability. He knew them intimately. He knew them. He had a relationship with them. He didn't just go and give his wealth to people he didn't know. He gave his wealth to people he entrusted, yeah, or the two of them, but we'll get to that. But it's like us. He gives us everything because he trusts us. He has a relationship with us. He loves us. But what is our ability? I can't tell you. I can't tell you what 
what your ability is, but I can tell you that God knows what it is, and He wants to give it to you. It's not this overcompensation that we do to go and fight for something. It's not this comparison. It's you do you. Me do me. (laughs) And we are so quick, so quick to sit there saying, but Lord, why? Why did you not give to me? Why didn't you give me five? You only gave me two. Why didn't you give me two? You only gave me one. And we sit there comparing ourselves. We sit there blaming God. We sit there saying, but you didn't give me. And it's like the world. Honestly, I, I love, and I've got a, a lot of time for social media and Facebook and the likes of. I do. However, I caught myself, and I had to delete Facebook the other day. I'll be a little bit vulnerable and say, I caught myself for hours on end just scrolling through other people's lives, looking at what God had given me. And I was like, no, enough's enough. I have to delete that. And I don't believe that we should be doing that. I don't believe that we should be sitting there saying, but God, why haven't you given me? We should be thanking God for what we have given. Have you ever thought that what He hasn't given you is not what you need? Have you ever thought that He doesn't want to give you that to do the thing that He wants you to do? I still don't understand why God gives us what He gives us. But I understand the grace He has for us, to use those talents and those gifts and to lift Him up with everything that we have. We are there to glorify Jesus with everything that we have. It says in 16, then He went on the journey. The man who received the five bags of gold went out at once and put the money to work. He gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags, sorry, I lost myself there. So also the one with the two bags of gold gained two more. And I think the most, the crux of this, of this whole parable is these three words, went at once. Went at once. It is an incredible picture of the three of them, all three of them went out at once and did something. They went and did something. The two went out and did something good. The other went out and did something not so good. So there's this automatic heart response from all three of them to do something. And that is what what we do. We sit there, we have this automatic response to what God gives us. And I'm asking myself the question tonight, what is my response? How am I responding? And we need to understand once again, like there there was no banking institutions back then. There was no things that they could go and put that money in. But the beautiful thing about the NIV and, 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 uh, is it says, they went out and made it work. They made that money work. I have, I, I'm privileged enough to be a part of a, a family business who's been running for 20 years, and we've had our ups and downs. And, but the most... One of the most crucial things that God has taught me is how to make money work. Have authority over money. And the the problem is we're so quick to allow money and finances to have control over us. But these guys didn't. These guys took authority and responsibility for what was given to them, and they went and made it work. And back then, they had to go and do something with that money. It's not like you could have gone and put in Bitcoin. You're going to lose money anyway. But they went out. They either bought a field, planted crop, got the, the fruit and whatever the stuff. I'm not a farmer. But they, they took that stuff and they sold it for a profit. Or they went out and uh, built a bakery and started making bread and they sold that for a profit. And I think we have got so lazy we have forgotten how to make things work. We've forgotten how to take what God has given us and make it work and put it to work. We live in this instant gratification society that you click and boom, it comes. 60 minutes and you get your groceries and anything later or over 60 minutes and we get our rate, we get cross. And let alone if you don't have a slot for that day, my goodness, then, then all, no, but we have got lazy 
We have got lazy with our talents. We've got lazy with what God has given us. These two guys had perseverance. They had success, and they were ready to give an account to their master. And I'm asking that of us today. As we sit here and as we worship Jesus, are we working what He's given us with perseverance, with success? And are you willing and waiting to give an account to Him and of Him? What is the point? And I'm asking you, what is the whole point of this? Are we sitting here and we have got saved and Jesus has come and He's he's given us life and we get this ticket to sit in this endless waiting room of eternity? No. No. God has given us the authority, the power by His Holy Spirit And the gifts that He's given us to advance the kingdom of God. To do it and to do it well. He has given us those things. And that, my friends, is the gospel story in action. But the man carries on and it says, The man who had received one bag (laughs) went off, dug a hole in the ground, and his master, uh, dig a hole for his master's money. And I'm going to put up my hand and say, like, I I feel like that guy sometimes. I don't know about you. I I just have this picture of this guy running away from getting this thing, putting his his head in his hands going, that was not the plan. I don't want this. That was not the plan that I had for my life. It is too much responsibility for me to do. And just take it away. Just take it. Take it away. I don't want it. And how often do we? We take what God gives us and we bury it and we push it down and all the stuff, we just push it, push it, push it and we cover it up with stuff. We cover it up with stuff in our lives so that we don't even realize it, let alone other people, let alone the church. God has given us spiritual gifts as well to advance the kingdom. He has given us spiritual gifts to do things, to see these kingdom grow, to see the church advance. And we forget that it is not the kingdom of heaven revolving around us. We seem to think that it goes around me. That's what we think. It's not. It is not. The kingdom of heaven revolves around Jesus Christ, and that will always be like that. But we have an opportunity to put up our hands and say, here I am, Lord, use me. Use me with what you have given me. Use me and use the talents you have given me to advance the kingdom. But I, I, don't know, I, I get this picture of the kingdom of heaven being like a wave. And for those, I was talking to Mark earlier about surfing. Those who surf understand that waves come in sets, Okay. And there's one or two really good big waves in each set. And it is like one of the surfers missing that wave and getting stuck out in the ocean going, oh, that feeling of, I missed it. I missed it. But you know what the beautiful thing is? The beautiful thing is just like sets of waves, God is like that with us. He gives us more opportunity. And I believe today... There's a God-given opportunity to do again. We're not going to miss it. And it's for for us to stand there and glorify Jesus in every, every single way. It says, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled their accounts with them. There's There's a time lapse here. It's not just a day or a week It was years. There needs to be this perseverance. There needs to be waiting with purpose. We have to wait with purpose. We have to wait with intention. We cannot do this without it. And our, our perception on waiting for Jesus would look very different. I can tell you it would look completely different if we knew Jesus coming back in five years compared to 200 years. Well, I'm going to ask you the question, what are you doing with yourself and the things that God has given to you if you knew Jesus was coming back in five years' time? There would be a complete revival tomorrow. There would be movement. There would be things happening. There would be 
people coming. There would be people going and there would be get people getting saved. Yeah. It says the man who received the five bags of gold brought back another five. He said, Master, he said, you have entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, my good and faithful servant. He said that same thing, and the same thing happened with the guy with two bags. And I'm going to put these guys together because I, I believe it's, it's a picture of us. It's a picture of us and how we are. They were both faithful. They might not have brought back the same amount of money, but there was a 100% return from both of them. There was five on five and two on two. There's a 100% return on that. And I believe it's a picture of them giving 100% of themselves. And we need to be giving 100% of ourselves to God. And we need to remember that the capital and the return in this parable wasn't owned by the slaves or the servants. It wasn't theirs. They had no right to it. Even though they got the return, it still belonged to the master. It's the same with us. God might give us things. He might give us abilities and talents. And we might see fruit from that. But that is not ours. That is His. It is His to give and take away. It's His to give us more or take away from us. And we need to remember that. It says... You have been faithful for a few things, and I will make you rule over many things. And I think, I think it's just a picture of how, how God, I think, sometimes tests that, that, that gift. He takes it, and He tests it to the max. He tests to see if you can make the simple well. And I think sometimes we just want to get to the end. We want to get to the... It's like a a footballer who wants to play, and he, he, doesn't want to, he doesn't want to do all the training and all the club stuff. He just wants to go to United and start, oh, that's not a good example either. But just, he wants to miss all the hardship and just get to the end. And I, like I said, we, we've, we, I have the privilege of having our own business, and I am so driven. I'm like that little bombshell. She, it, she is feisty, and I will do anything to make things work. I have, I'm driven, and I've got one goal at mine, is that, that's growth. I've got to see growth. But I, recently, God has stopped me, or stopped me and us and said, I don't want to take you to that next season. I can't give you that thing until you fix what is here. Fix the simple and we're working through that, and we're going through it. And I know God will take us and take us into the next season. These guys received praise from their master. And I don't know about you, but it's one thing that I yearn for one day, to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I yearn for that because I can do anything in the world, but that is what I do things for, to hear that one day. They received praise. They received promise. And they received the joy of the Lord. Then the man who received one bag of gold came and said, Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid the gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. And before I get to that guy, I think we need to understand that this master, he judged his servants individually. There was an individual judgment. He had a relationship, a strong relationship with every single one of them, well enough to know how to judge them. He didn't judge them as a whole, because actually there was a seven, seven back from, there's seven out of eight, that's a good return if he judged them as a whole. But that's not how, um, that's not, that's not right. And it's exactly how God is going to judge us one day. I am going to stand before God one day and be accountable for the things that I have done. I'm going to be accountable for the things that I have used 
that He has given me. And unfortunately, so will you. We're not going to be standing there as a group one day in front of God being judged on average. He wants that personal relationship. He wants to be in with you. But this guy, this guy that went and dug the stuff, there was, more of, there was more of an issue. It wasn't just a, a faith issue. It wasn't just a fear issue that he had. Because if it was those two things, he would have taken that money, put it into a bank or some sort of bank. I don't understand it. But, and they would have got a return. But there's more of a root issue here. There's more of a root problem here that completely clouded what he thought, how he thought it, and what he had to do with it. He didn't think, he didn't work, he didn't even try. And what he did was make excuses. He made excuses. He seemed to think that that gift or that talent, that that money that he was given, he could do what he wanted with. No. He threw it straight back at God, at His Master. And I think some of us do that as well. Some of us sit there saying, no, Lord, I don't want it. Take it, take it. I don't, I can't do it. I have nothing in me to use that with. But I think we need to change how we do things. And ultimately, it's not about how much we produce. It's not. It's not about how much we get back but it's actually how much we grasp the understanding of who the master is and understanding of what he wants us to do. There needs to be this revelation that God gives us things to use and we need to take it with two hands and we need to make it work. We need to make it work, friends. We can't just sit there in this waiting room of eternity, doing nothing. And just in closing, I'm not going to throw seed at you. No names mentioned. Nor am I going to put up a feast chair before you've eaten, eaten supper. No names mentioned. But I'm going to do, and I'm going to ask you to do something practical. I'm going to ask you to look at the soles of your shoes. I'm, gonna, I'm looking at the sole of my shoes. And I think it's this prophetic declaration, this prophetic picture, this thing that God is saying, like, what does it look like? Does it look as it came out the box? Do your shoes look like they are brand new or are they worn and you need more tread? Because we need to have those type of shoes. God is asking us. He's saying, I want you to take that thing I've given you and make it work. Go out and make it work. Go and make work what I've given you. And there's a, there's a slide, one more slide. Okay, no, not one more slide. Miles Monroe says the graveyard is the richest place on the surface of the earth because there you will see the books that weren't published, the ideas that were not harnessed, songs that were not sung, and drama pieces that were never, ever acted. And there needs to be this response. There needs to be a response from us, not only to be more like the guy or the two guys, but more not like the other guy. We need to be asking God to rip out, rip out that root in us that is blinding us from using that talent. What an amazing word. We hope you enjoyed that sermon. If you would like to find out more about Life Changes Church, why don't you go onto our website or you can follow us on our social media. Have an amazing, amazing week.